This episode is brought to you by Vital Farms. Isn't it bullshit to have to question where your food comes from? At Vital Farms, you can trace your pasture-raised eggs all the way back to the source, the pasture. On the side of each pasture-raised carton of eggs, you'll find the name of the farm where your eggs were laid. And when you look the farm up on their website, you'll get a peek at all the sunshine, fresh air, and open space the hens enjoy. Learn more and find out where to buy them at vitalfarms.com. Vital Farms, keeping it bullshit free. This episode is brought to you by Clavio, the platform that powers smarter digital relationships. With Clavio, you can activate all your customer data in real time, connect seamlessly with your customers across all channels, guide your marketing strategy with AI powered insights, recommendations, and automated assistance, deliver experiences that feel individually designed at scale, and grow your business faster. Power smarter digital relationships with Clavio. Learn more at Clavio.com slash Spotify. That's K L A V I Y O.com slash Spotify. Between the kids being home and hosting, everything in our house gets used up in summer. With Instacart, I can save money by stocking up on all my favorite summer brands. I save time by getting everything delivered in as fast as an hour. And I save myself a sink full of dirty dishes by stocking up on paper plates for the annual summer cookout. Save more on summer essentials? Spend more time enjoying summer. Add summer to cart. Download the app to get free delivery on your first three orders. Offer valid for a limited time. Minimum $10 per order. Additional terms apply. This episode is brought to you by Shopify. No matter how big you want to grow, Shopify gives you everything you need to take your business to the next level. Shopify is the commerce platform that makes it easy to show up and sell exactly the way you want to. No need to code or design. Sign up for your $1 per month trial period today. Visit shopify.com slash offer 23 to get started. LinkedIn presents. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, where your source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development where we share original research, explore industry trends, and interview executives and thought leaders from across the globe. We hope you join us often for practitioner-oriented content around all things related to leadership, HR, talent management, organizational development, and change management. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. you enjoy the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, enjoy ad-free listening by going to the Patreon page, and please consider contributing even at the producer or sponsorship level. And please leave a review. Thank you for your support. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this HCI podcast episode, I talk with Solange Charas and Stella Lupashore about HR and the future of work and skills-based versus credential-based hiring. Solange Shara and Stella Lupashore, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Thrilled to be here. Thank you for having us back. Yeah, it's a pleasure to have you back. I'm trying to remember is maybe what, four to six months ago that we had you on last time. You had a chance to talk about your new book, which was a fabulous conversation. Today, we're going to continue that conversation. We're going to talk about HR and the future of work, more specifically around skill-based versus credential-based hiring in the workforce as we move into the future of work. As we get started, I wanted to share Solange and Stella's bio with everybody. Solange Charas is the founder and CEO of HC Moneyball, an adjunct professor and governance researcher and thought leader. Stella Lupishore is a thought leader, speaker, educator, and futurist on a mission to humanize the workplace through the use of design thinking, technology, analytics, and future thinking to create inclusive workplaces. And I could say way more about both of you, but I'm going to pause there and just give you both a chance to share anything else about yourself, your background, your personal context that you would like to highlight for the audience. I will start with the fact that uh, we both teach. We both teach in higher institutions. So the topic of today's conversation, I think it's very relevant, not only professionally from my job perspective, but professionally as educators as well. So looking forward to diving in. 
between Stella and myself, we teach at four different institutions, or you teach also at Cornell, so five different institutions. So we sort of have our pulse on the the industry, the ed- higher education industry. Yeah, wonderful. And I don't know if you remember, but I'm a university professor. That's my full-time gig, and I do consulting work on the side. So I think between the three of us, we have a lot uh, of knowledge and insight and experience in both higher ed and in the workplace, uh, in the consulting space. Uh, so I think this will be a great conversation. I'm excited to hear your thoughts around work, uh, the future of work and skills-based versus credential-based hiring. So why don't we start by defining those a little bit? What do you mean by sure. skills-based uh, work versus credential-based work, or, or sorry, credential-based hiring and skills-based hiring? Yeah, so um, organizations, and we're sort of jumping into the middle. So let me just give a little sentence and then let's back out a little bit to create a context to understand um, what we're thinking about in this conversation. Um, Today's challenge for most organizations, and if you look at the CEO um, survey on uh, top issues that the conference board uh, does every year, um, talent is amongst the top five And if you look, talent acquisition, and if you look at the CHRO survey that the conference board does every year, across the globe, talent acquisition is the number one topic. So companies are really struggling with finding talent. And we think that one of the reasons that they're having difficulty finding talent is because of the criteria that they set in place for their screening. So what happens is we've got structural unemployment. So even though our unemployment rate is very low, um, the majority of that unemployment is structural unemployment. So there's essentially three different types of unemployment. There's frictional unemployment, which is basically unemployment of people that are in the midst of changing jobs. So it's just the frictional part going from one job to another. There's seasonal or cyclical unemployment, which is um, attached to business cycles. So we see, you know, gig or seasonal or cyclical workers around Christmas time. So people always, you know, salespeople find it easier to find a job when companies are hiring for seasonal work. And then the third one is structural unemployment. Um, And structural unemployment refers to the mismatch between the jobs that are available and the skill levels of the unemployed. Um, And it is the one that is the most persistent. We can't wait for time to fix that problem. We actually have to have some type of an intervention to solve it. Um, So unlike cyclical unemployment, um, it's, it's not a business cycle issue. Um, We have about 10 and a half million or so open jobs and about 6 million people that are on that are on the unemployment roster. We have more unemployed that have just given up looking for a job because they simply can't find one. It's important to note the only people that count towards the official unemployment numbers are the people who are actively looking, right? Right, exactly, exactly. And what If you look at the BLS data and you look at the research in this area, structural unemployment really comprises the vast majority of the reason for unemployment. So think about the tech sector uh, layoffs. Tens of thousands of employees are now unemployed, and yet the unemployment rate didn't go up during this period, during these last six months, when the tech industry was shedding jobs um, for a couple of reasons. One is the tech sector actually overhired in the prior two years, so they're actually getting rid of excess labor. Um, and people in those jobs, for the most part, were able to find new jobs because it's not just the Googles and the Metas in the world that are hiring tech people. It's all the mid and small size companies that are hiring tech people that have everyone been is locked, <laughs> yeah, that have been locked into those behemoths. And when they let them go, I actually think it's a good thing because now we're doing technology transfer from the Googles and the Metas and the Yahoos of the world um, and the Apples of the world into our mid and small cap companies. So I think that's a good thing. 
Um, but structural unemployment is really harmful to the economy um, because as industries evolve and the requirement for competencies grow, the skill gap widens. And it also increases US income inequality, which we'll get to in a second. Um, so we, we are really interested in this dilemma that organizations say they can't find talent. And you know, we started off by saying, skills-based versus um, credential-based. And what most organizations do for good, for better or for worse, is for um, pretty much, I'd say, I throw a guess out there, 70% of entry-level jobs, forget about the mid-level manager and executive, they set a standard of having a college degree to do the job. And um, I'm not going to take Stella's words away from her, but we'll get to that in a second. Um, roughly 60% of all job op openings require at least some college with approximately 30% of the openings requiring a bachelor's degree. We're calling this the diploma ceiling. Um, and I actually Googled diploma ceiling and couldn't find anything. So maybe this is <laughs> original for us. You've coined a new term, wonderful. You've coined a new term, <laughs> the diploma ceiling. So what's really interesting is that according to the BLS data, there are as many people in the labor force over 25 years of age with high school diplomas as there are with pe people with college degrees. So the numbers are 23.6 and 23.7% respectively. So these two groups, the high school diploma and the college diploma or the degree are actually the same size. Um, and if you combine high school and some college, the number goes up to 43.8%. So about 43, 44% of the workforce has a high school diploma and some college. And um, it's incredibly close to the percent of the workforce that is considered a low and moderate income earner or an LMI, which is at about 54%. So about 54% of our workforce is considered a low or moderate income earner. That's the majority. And those LMIs are around, they're at the poverty level or slightly above the poverty level, but certainly not in a position to, um, to improve their economic conditions. So what we're thinking around this is that um, companies are actually perpetuating poverty in the United States because they're forcing people to get a college degree to do jobs that may not need college degrees. And um, the college education since 1980, since when I got my degree, so I went to UC Berkeley, and it cost me about $720 a year for my tuition. I just looked at the UC Berkeley website, and for an in-state, because I was in-state, um, it cost $9,594 in tuition. That's not cost of books, anything else. That's a 1,332% increase in tuition and the marginal improvement in your earnings between 1980 and today is not 1,332%. You've highlighted some really great um, elements there around structural unemployment, um, just the, the makeup of the labor market, uh, and the way that organizations often, um, they, they artificially limit and reduce the size of their, the pool of potential uh, people uh, to apply for positions. Um, Stella, I wanted to give you a chance to jump in and see if there's any additional insights you want to provide in response to. I was going to hand it over to her. <laughs> Absolutely. And when we think about the labor market and the fact that it's it's a very 
interesting time uh, for economists, right? Because usually you would see when there are layoffs, when we're heading towards recession, labor market follows and there is a, a growth in unemployment. But we are dealing with an environment where a lot of people left the labor market. We have a, a big proportion of um, uh, baby boomers who chose to retire or some who retired early. We have uh, just lost a lot of people, uh, like 900,000 um, uh, working age population who died and, and uh, are no longer available to be employed. We have a significant number of people, a younger generations who have um, decided to pursue independent solopreneur gig uh, uh, employment. So the traditional employment that economists care about it just doesn't have enough people to um to tap into so organizations have to be creative about how they rethink the talent pools how they rethink the barriers to good employment and what constitutes good employment uh so when we start with the opportunities companies can uh can tap into all right first of all you need to think what is the work that needs to get done what are they Activity is the essence because no longer job descriptions would address everything that uh, is required. And many times job description is used to uh, parse people out as opposed to saying, how can we get, get them in for whatever, maybe 60, 70, 80% of what is required based on that job description. And then the rest of it could be something that can be developed on the job, something that will change anyway, um, right. something that we can uh, uh, use this as an opportunity for people to feel they have a, a space to grow, as opposed to, you know, if they've done everything that's required by the job, they're not going to be interested in, in that job in the first place, or it will not give them a sense of growth and development. Um, the other opportunity is now with advent of all of the technological innovations, there is really time to rethink the activities that people do. And yes, everybody talks about chat GPT and all of the, the disruption that will have a knowledge work. But that's a good thing because it'll augment and you can outsource repetitive activities. You can um, leave the human work for humans. And it's an impetus for organizations to rethink the workflow, rethink the activities that uh, get, need to be uh, part of a, someone's responsibilities. And based on these changes, then we can rethink job descriptions. What do they include? Do we use language that is precluding certain candidates from applying? Uh, do we say, um, you know, credential is required, for your credential is required? Uh, do we say, maybe for your credential, not required, but desirable, because all of these little signals are going to be interpreted very black and white by the algorithm that assess candidates. And inevitably, you're going to end up with a significantly smaller and less diverse talent pool as a result of um, doing those uh, uh, automatic classifications. And then, can I just yeah, can I double please. click on that for just a yes. second? There's a lot of reasons why this is a hard thing for the economy generally, for society generally, but for organizations specifically. Um, but you just highlighted, well, you just mentioned. I want to highlight the the diversity, equity, and inclusion component here. Yeah. How how often do we artificially limit the the pool of candidates that? disproportionately benefit certain groups and dis, uh, yep. disproportionately negatively benefit or negatively takes away from other groups. It happens all the time. All the time. And, and so if, if you're wanting to increase the diversity in your pool, which will then hopefully lead to more diversity in the hiring process and, and, and bringing people on and, and the types of inclusive and, and belonging environments uh, and cultures that exist within organizations, you know, one of the, easy ways. I mean, it's not easy, I suppose, but one of the first steps is to just rethink what yeah. you're requiring in your job postings, because there, there is research that shows that men, frankly, don't need to uh, check all the boxes. They'll apply for jobs yeah. that they aren't a good fit for at all, but yeah. women disproportionately will often feel like, oh, I'm not a candidate. I'm not even going to apply. I'm not going to throw my hat in the ring for something because I, you know, I'm not as qualified as I should be. Uh, even though they're way more qualified than a bunch of men who are applying and eventually will be the ones to get the job. Exactly. And, and just to jump in here for a second, we have outsourced 
to AI and to machine learning, the screening process. And those, that technology is programmed mostly by white guys. So there's, it's not nefarious, it's just hidden bias. And, and I think that also contributes to the problem. It's not just that the candidate pool isn't big enough, you know, women aren't applying for jobs. It's that when they put their resumes in, it's not even a human being that's looking at the resume. It is machine learning. And that machine was programmed by, by white guys. And I, I, I don't mean that in a bad way. I'm just saying that and, the technology sector is predominantly white male. And, and it's so, trained on the data from the past, which was disproportionately hiring more that's white right. dudes, right? That's right. Yep. So, so to, I love the kind of diversion into the uh, diverse talent pools because we typically think of diversity just the visual uh, um, identifiers, right? What's visible as far as race, gender, um, abilities. But there is a broader spectrum of talent that we can tap into. So once we understand what are the changes to the work, change the job description to reflect that, and then tap into a diverse spectrum of talent options, right? Look at people who recently retired. They already have the knowledge. They know what needs to get done. They understand the culture, bring them back as contractors to fill in the gaps for specific needs. They will also develop the next generation of leaders and uh, kind of the uh, leadership pipeline. Uh, they can coach, they can mentor. Look at people with um, schedule limitations, right? You have significant number of, uh, younger, becoming disproportionately younger set of millennials who are caregivers. They may have chosen to stay home so they can have the ability to care for their parents or family members. Maybe they have several hours in the afternoon. Yes, it's not a full-time job, but they have the skills, time, and interest to contribute. It may require a little bit different orchestration and a different way of allocating and parsing the work, but it's a perfectly uh, capable uh, segment of talent that typically goes under tapped and underutilized. And then more importantly, when you think about work, you really need to think from perspective of making it a living wage, right? Solange mentioned about the poverty line and the further, the, the more we deconstruct and decompose work and outsource a lot of the technical work now to technology, what's left it's essential work. And it became very obvious how important and uh, uh, difficult it is to replace when there aren't essential workers to do that work. Why is it that the essential work is usually the lowest paid too, right? So we're thinking the activities and making it easy for somebody to stay with you as opposed to trying to piecemeal three, four, uh, job so they can have a, a living wage uh, to, to to have a, a, a normal life. So there are a lot of opportunities from analytics perspective, there are a lot of opportunities from talent acquisition practices, and yeah. as well as managers' uh, education on how to uh, handle candidate slates that they see and, and make decision on. We're asking for a heavy lift, right? It's a heavy lift to look at your organization, to look at the business model, to look at that labor input, and then redesign that. That is a heavy lift. And it's required because that's the, that is the source of the structural unemployment. So if we want long-term future um, to be healthy, organizations need to do that today. But here's a short-term fix. Um, lower the requirement for an entry-level job, right? You don't necessarily have to, as Stella said, maybe you put college degree optional, or maybe you look at people who have come through a trade school. So we've seen higher enrollments in trade schools went up 19% over, uh, over 2020, you know, in 2022 over the prior year. And I think it's also because there's better utility right? So a college a person who's college bound says, I'm going to spend 40 to a hundred plus thousand dollars in my education. 
And is it worth it? And I think a lot of young people are looking at college, and that's why we see college enrollment going down by about 8%, saying it's not worth spending this amount of money for something that I don't think is going to bring that kind of value in the future. So I think we've got exogenous external factors, endogenous internal factors that are all coming together that point to let's relook at the you know, the ante, right? The the table stakes for getting a job. And here's the thing that's really, really absurd to me. Um, There's a project, project that's going on right now at Northwestern University called the Employment Quality Project. And I just had a conversation with one of the people that's there. Stella, can I say her name? Yeah. Janitha Gray, um, who's a researcher in that, pro- in that project. And she told me something really interesting. She told me that for most of the big organizations that are participating in that research, they do not keep information about college education in their HRIS systems. They only use it to screen candidates. And then when you're in the door, these organizations, these big organizations, I'm talking about the Fortune 50, do not keep that information in their systems to use it. And so it's just a way of screening out. It's not even being used by the companies. And it just makes me scratch my head, like, why does it exist at all? If you're not going to track that for your employees, why even use it as a way to screen and well and and to, it, it, it's crazy it's crazy one that you'd use this arbitrary measure to screen for things that probably don't even need it as a screening tool right. and then two if you are going to use it to screen and you already collect the information why in the world wouldn't you utilize that information as you're trying to understand and assess the the skills of, of members of your team for future opportunities, et cetera. It, it really is crazy. It is crazy. And, um, you know, the job training industry is an $18 billion industry. Companies are spending $18 billion to train people. So why not let people that don't have a college degree in the door, if you're already going to spend money on training them, have it be, you know, have it have utility, right? So um, the, one of the things that you know, we're seeing in our research, and we know when we price out the cost of attrition, that the cost of attrition far outweighs the cost of training and development or the cost of just improving salaries so that you hit at least a minimum wage level, right? The I guess the highest minimum wage level because every state has its its own rules. But, you know, being penny wise and pound foolish is what most organizations are doing today. They just rather scrimp and save on paying people and replacing those people than simply just giving them a decent wage so that they don't have to have patchwork careers, three, four careers or three, four jobs just to make ends meet. It's like reinforcing the um, class system. Right. And it's it, it's not going to it's not sustainable. It's not going to work. Companies are dying for um, employees. Employees are dying for opportunities. And the barrier is the something artificial around college education. And again, that's coming from three people that believe in college education. Right. <laughs> um, I think college education is really important. I think it plays a huge role. Uh but not for every position uh, yeah. and certainly not for every in- entry level position. And, and we already do this to an extent, like, you know, people get hired all the time for things that they're not particularly traditionally qualified for um, because they know somebody because someone else sees that talent in them. It happens all the time already. And so all we're suggesting is maybe pull back the covers a little bit and make it a little bit more of an open process. So people can, you know, explore what the possibilities might be for them. And it it benefits the individual, but it benefits the organization as well. The fight for talent is real and it's not going to get easier. Um, And we we need to constantly be looking at ways to reskill and upskill our people. Some of that's going to involve credentials and that's great, um, but not always. And and for uh, 
we need to just be much pro- more proactive in organizations. And I, maybe the, the final thing I'll say on this before we start to wrap up, um, organizations should be reevaluating jobs on a continual basis anyways. So it is a heavy lift, yes. Uh, but it's just build it into your normal process of reviewing jobs, job design, redesign, uh, and the the whole workflow. And if you start to build that into what you hopefully are already doing, then it's not such a huge, crazy, heavy lift. It just becomes part of the process. And within a couple of years, you will have transformed the way your organization functions in terms of a talent uh, perspective. Well, Stella and Solange, this has been a great conversation. I know at the time and I do need to let you go. But before we wrap things up for today, I wanted to give you a chance to share with the audience how they can connect with you, find out more about your work, and then give us a final word on the topic for today. Stella Lupushar. So it's Stella with one L at Reframe Work, Reframe Period Work, or find me on LinkedIn, Stella with one L. There aren't that many of us. Solange? <laughs> uh, there's only one Solange Shara at uh, on LinkedIn, and you can get you can write to me at S-C-H-A-R-A-S at hcmoneyball.com. Um, you can find pretty much everything that we're talking about today in our book, um, which is really a, a blueprint, a roadmap for helping you to use data analytics to understand your organization and how to improve the effectiveness of human capital programs. And our website for the book is www.humanizinghumancapital.com. Wonderful. Thank you both. It has been a real pleasure. I encourage the audience to reach out, get connected, find out more about what Stella and Solange can do for you. Check out the book. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. Do you enjoy the Human Capital Innovations Podcast? Enjoy ad-free listening by going to the Patreon page. And please consider contributing even at the producer or sponsorship level. And please leave a review. Thank you for your support. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week.